רג שמח. רג שמח, בבקשה. Uh, it was a big party last night. Uh, where was it? Oh, in the heart. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they, they, they do it here. Like the, right, right, right. In the past, we've had bigger bonfires, but the city is very. Yeah, yeah. Very much more, but it's a party. That's the main thing. You know? <laughs> it's good. I I got a I got a souvenir. A bird. Oh no. See that? Even with the small fire. Believe it or not, yes, it was from Warshaw. I did give her a Warshaw. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> Chris, you're on camera. But. <laughs> so, how did you, how did you, did you enjoy the uh, gathering yesterday? Amazing, huh? It's, uh, I see the bigger group. Not just a few people in the classroom. A lot of the rabbis are there. Sorry? A lot of the rabbis are there. Our teachers are there. The French department. No, oh, I'm, I'm now referring back to the gathering in the morning. Oh. How did you, how did you the, the, uh, the one we had there in the, oh. in the social hall? English department gathering. Oh, yeah. Everybody introduced themselves. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, I knew most of the people already. So. Okay. Um, I thought, I thought it was really nice to see everybody interviewing each other and talking to each other. I don't know if that's something very uh, was important to me. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, Pirkevot because uh, I want to show you a few things in the Mishnah, which we've been discussing, of course, the Tanaitic period. Worked out perfectly that we're talking about Rabbi Akiva and Bar Kokhba, which is all during the Tanaitic period, which is the period of the sages. Right? So we'll start from the beginning once again. Moshe Kibbal Torah Messina, Umasar Ali Yoshua. Everybody got it? Perk Aleph? Perk Aleph. Mishnah Aleph. Who knows it off by heart? Do I offer a prize for this? Moshe, how are you doing on Shas? Uh, Halfway, you said. Uh, no, now I'm almost through uh, memorizing Kedoshim. It's just a matter of. Kodashim. Kedoshim. Actually, it should be Kodashim. It's a mistake. Kodashim is the way it should be pronounced. Uh, they said Machloket, but some people say Kadashim. But, uh, yeah, the fifth one. All right, anyways, Moshe Kibel to Rabbi Sinai. This is also something that's worthy of, chancel- of, of memorization. Moshe Kibel to Rabbi Sinai. Moshe Rabbi Yeshua. Yeshua. This is Kenim. This is Kenim. Lenvim. Univim. Mesaruha. Lanshei. Knesset. Wow. That's like, you realize, what, what just happened in that, those, those two lines? Foundations first and second period. A thousand years. A thousand years. A thousand years. <laughs> in one sentence. You see that? That's quite a sketch of a history. What is the idea? Is it a historical record? How can I, you take that seriously? A thousand years in one sentence, two sentences, two, two lines. It's obviously giving us a message. It's very, uh, What's the message that the Mishnah could be telling us? Uh, they didn't know history? They didn't care? What, what, what could be the message? I was assuming that we already knew the finer details. Maybe. What else? But what's, that's not a message. What's the message? Um, they... Uh, Right, you see that Moshe, we said the foundation period, right? Yoshua, that's all of the right. And then Zikanim also, the first period, then Nevi'im. Nevi'im, the entire first temple period. Nevi'im. Nevi'im, Mesura and Sheikh Nasagula were in the second temple period also. So there's one word for all of 500 years. Prophets. Okay, the prophets. I think they did the reason why it's only one sentence written down here is because we have the Tanakh for itself, who is written for itself. It's true. That we're not trying to, this Mishnah is not trying to teach you all of Tanakh, 100%. It's true. But what is the Mishnah trying to teach you? <laughs> if it's not trying to teach you the Tanakh, why, why say it at all? No. What's it trying to say?
Could you give us a hint? Um, well, what have we been doing here? We've been trying to grasp it all in uh, like historical context, right? Into different is, stages is of history. I, I think it's not. I think it's not doing that. Um, but ultimately, do, are, are we stopping at the period of the sages? We're going to go on to the fifth. Good morning. The fifth period, and the sixth period, and the seventh period. And then here we are, sitting right here in this room. Good morning, good morning. So what's the... I'm just giving you hints here. Let's read it again. Moshe kibel Torah Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai. Umesara, and he handed it over to Yoshua. He handed it over. Okay, the word is mesara. He passed it. There's something called a masora. Masora means a transmitted tradition, right? So mesara. He handed it down, and then right, right, what? Arts Kromosora, it's the name of an organization, that's correct. It's, it's named after that, that concept of, of a tradition that gets handed down. U mesara Yeshua, Yeshua is king, is king, and Nevi'im, u the word gets repeated again. The Nevi'im, the prophets, handed it over. Uh, David, if you could give a Mishnah to uh, Yisrael, that'd be great. Handed it over to Anshei Knesset Hagdola, to the man of the Great of Assembly, and we talked about who these men in the Great Assembly are. and uh, So the, the only word that really repeats itself twice is Mesaruha, Mesara, Limsor, to hand it over. And we said there's a concept called Mesora. So I think that that's the key. That's the key here. Is it sort of explaining that the Torah is being always being handed down generation to generation, that's sort of the message is that this is a perpetual occurrence. Uh, yes, but uh, let's, let's fine-tune it a little bit. I think uh, the, the concept is that... Um, so, Umas Torah, does it um, tell us about the, 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 uh, about the, uh, about the, like the, the what's written? Uh, what the Torah, but uh, also the uh, oral Torah. The oral Torah. Yes. The oral Torah. Let me ask you, what comes next? What comes next? What are we? What are we reading? So, oh, so it's what like, are we reading? Oh, what is okay. this? I, it's it's talking about it's it's giving context to the because Pirkei uh, Avos gives like it, it what is it? after this with the um, with the heritage of the Torah going downward from Moshe going down. We did already to Moshe. We're already at yes. Anshei Knesset What know. comes after that? And it continues that. What comes after that? So we start here, it says, Anshei Knesset And then it gives some... What's the, next? The, next, the, next the, Mishnah. The, it gives some teachings. They want to give us to understand, make us understand that they have the authority from Moshe to... Authority on it. Authorities, the, yes. The yes, yes. From Moshe directly. Right. And then they continue to teach us based on... Okay, and who, who's the, them? The are they are they the ones writing now? The Czech Nestak Who what is this? What are we what book are we holding? No, when was it written? No, oh, this is a later, this is five hundred years after them. Rabbi Hudanasi, yeah, that's right. Tanaim. And and what comes after this Mishnah? Right, we we went through it last time. Shimon Tzadik, right? He was one of the last of the Chiknes. And then they look in Mishnah Gimel, Mishnah Gimel, third Mishnah, turn the page. Antignos, and then in Mishnah Dalit, Yossi and Yossi. You see that Mishnah Hey. So Yossi. Uh, the Mishnah Vav is Yoshua and Nitai. What do we call these? The Zugot. The Zugot. The pairs. That's right. So, okay, we're reading about the pair. So the, the chain continues, right? If you want to say the chain of transmission, right? Mesara, Mesora, the chain of transition, uh, of, transmi the, of transmission continues. And then what do we get to at the end? Who was the last of the pairs? Who sees that? Mishnah 12, you'd bet. Hill and Shammai. Hill and Shammai, very good. And they were the last of the pairs. What happens after them? Then there's Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, Ben Gamliel. 
And look at Mishnah, uh, Perak Bet, Mishnah Aleph. Perak Bet, Mishnah Aleph. That's chapter 2, Mishnah 1. Rabbi Yomer. Right? Rabbi Yudha Nasi. Wait, so what period are we in then? In the sages. In the what period of the sages, the right there. Two? Yeah, period, chapter 2, yeah. Uh, it's Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yudha Nasi. What, what about Mishnah 2? Mishnah 2. Chapter 2, Mishnah 2. Rama Gamliel. Yeah, Rama Gamliel. No, so Rabbi Yudha Nasi. Wow. He speaks as well. And then if you look at Mishnah Hay, Chapter 2, Mishnah Hay, we have go back to Hillel. Hillel. Basically, what are we reading? And if you look in, um, look at chapter 2, Mishnah 9. Right? Sorry, I'm skipping with you, but try to keep up. Oh, Kibel, me, Hillel, and Shammai. That's interesting. When was he? Do you remember Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai? The guy who faked his death to leave Jerusalem under siege to ask for Yavne and Chachamea, the first generation of the Tanaim. Kibel mi Hillel v'Shamai. Who were Hillel v'Shamai, the last of the? Of the Zugot. Of the Zugot, right? And so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is the beginning. Right, we have he received from the pairs, from uh, Hillel and Shammai. And then it says in Mishnah Tet, Mishnah Yud, Chamisha Talmidim, there are five disciples of Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai. This is sort of what chapter? Chapter 2, Mishnah 10. Chapter 2, Mishnah 10. <coughs> What were the names of the, his students? Ben Horkinus. You recognize those names? Not at all. Think again. Just think for a second. Rabbi Eliezer Ben Horkinus and Rabbi Yoshua Ben Hananiah. Oh, with the oven, no? with the oven. That were the guys with the oven. They're right here on the board. We talked to them, Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. We thought the guys from the oven, exactly. And then they had Rabbi Kiva join the story too. If you remember the young Rabbi Kiva, he was their disciple. So here he had five disciples, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon ben Nathan, and Rabbi Lazar ben Arach. Okay, and then they, he enumerates all of the merits. Wow, so what are we talking about now? The first and the second generation of the Tanaim, the Tanaitic period. Well, it makes sense. What is this book called? And what is it part of? Pirkei Avot is part of the Mishnah, right? The Mishnah records the words of the? Of the Tanaim. Very good. Let's skip ahead to... Um, um, Okay, so we hear we have here the words of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. And Pirkei Avot. We're looking at Pirkei Avot uh, one more time. Uh, just to show you. So what, I'm going to go back to the first Mishnah. First Mishnah, Pirkei Avot. Perik Aleph, Mishnah Aleph. What is it trying to teach us? Sheki Bel Torah Yoshua. Moshe received the Torah from Joshua. Sorry, Joshua <laughs> received the Torah from Moshe. And, Mo, and, and the, the elders received it from Joshua. And the prophets received it from the elders. And the members of the great assembly received it from the prophets. What's the point of this Mishnah? It's a very brief, brief sketch of history can't really be too that historical. You leave out, a, a thou, if you do a thousand years in one line. So what's the point? What is this part of? What is this book? It's part of the Mishnah. And what are we saying? What is the is author of this telling us? What do you say, Amos? About the oral Torah. What about the oral Torah? That it is brought from generation to generation to generation and giving to each other and we, we are part of it. Excellent, excellent. Two points. One is uh, 
as we were, we, uh, David started to say that, that this Mishnah, this book of the Oral Torah, in the period of the sages, a thousand, five hundred years later, not just a thousand years, and Sheikh Nesach Dola is just the beginning of the story in the Second Temple, but actually the rest of the book is all the words of the Tanaim, from the period of the sages. Right? They start off with the pairs, but then they go quickly to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva, all these, these, these Tanaim, this is what the Mishnah does, it recollects their words. All of this, what did I call it? The book of Judaism? The primary book of Judaism? Don't think that it's disconnected from... Right? The Talmud, is, uh, Mishnah is part of the Talmud, right? Yeah. Mishnah, is a, Mishnah and the Gemara is the Talmud, right? So don't think that this is disconnected from what happened before, from the written Torah, from the Tanakh. Yes. This is a chain of Masora, transmitted tradition, TT, transmitted tradition, Masora. Masoret is the, the word for Masoret. So Masoret is, is the word Masoret, which is many times in modern Hebrew used for a tradition. Usually, they're uh, in the context that we're discussing now, we say the word as Mesora. Mesora is something, uh, I'm going to write the translation, transmitted tradition. That's why I call it TT. Transmitted tradition. The Misora. Moshe knows there's an organization in America called Torah U Misora. Because it's, it's an educational organization that has schools, it has uh, camps, it has all sorts of... Uh, they try to do uh, Jewish education in America. And they call themselves Torah, because they're teaching Torah. U Misora. And the transmitted tradition. This Mishnah, this new innovative book, do you think uh, it was, it was uh, accepted lightly by the other sages that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, what a revolutionary, he wrote down for the first time, you're not allowed to write down the oral Torah. He wrote it down. It's called the oral Torah. I'm assuming they were not happy. Uh, I assume not. Uh, it was quite a, a reform. Quite a reform. They must have called him a reformed Jew. He was a reformer. He was a revolutionary thing. He created a new book. You know what he says here? He says, don't think that all of this, there's so much scholarship here. Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the Talmud, the entire Shas. This is not a break from what you might call biblical Judaism. Right? The Judaism revolving around the written Torah, the Bible. And the fact that we have a new book, it's not to replace the Bible. But the concept is there's an oral Torah which is just as ancient as what was written in the, in the Tanakh. It's the Masora, oral law, that gets passed down from generation to generation <laughs> through 1,500 years of history till this point. Till we can read this, this, this book, this new book called the Book of the Mishnah. Shisha Sidre Mishnah, and Pirkei Avot is one part of it. Okay, so oftentimes we have a recording of, of this sort of chain of tradition, the Mesora, the tradition, the Mesora, and uh, yes, Amos, question. Do you think if the, the way how we write the Mishnah, it's like, I really like the explanation, someone explained me that it's like the titles. And it's, and it's not the whole really detailed thing, it's the title about the subject. Maybe the reason why, there was, do you think it's the reason why you write it this way? Not really exactly, but just the title that we can discuss about it and talk in different uh, time of the uh, existence of the human being? Mm -hmm. or, yeah, uh, uh, beautiful, it's true. The Mishnah is actually quite short. I know it's six full volumes, and then, you know, we talked about it being how many chapters? 530 chapters? Well, we had that on the list. Uh -huh. Who remembers how many chapters is, is the Mishnah? 
Six orders, 63 Masechtot, 500. Moshe has it open. Moshe, what's the, how many chapters? Oh, six, five, 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 five,
if I don't have my Wi-Fi on, it's not going to work, I think. Just one second. Um. Okay, so you have the, the whole Mishnah recited for you. And you can listen to it and follow along on the app, including afterwards the commentary, which, which describes it. It doesn't roll the text, but you roll the text. Here you have the commentary in English, translation in English, and um, the, not only the uh, translation of the Mishnah, but also the translation of the commentary. Very, very clear. One of the most clear commentaries on the Mishnah. In any case, let's open up to our Mishnah that we're discussing. It's the last Masechet in Seder Mo'ed. Does anybody know what that means? Let me let me teach you. What are the Shisha Seder Mishnah? We're going to have to erase some stuff here. Because... Uh, is the app is called Mishnayel Kahati? Or just Kahati. I think it's just called Kahati. Um, what does this mean? It means, it means, it means nothing really. really. It really means nothing. But it's an acronym. It's an acronym for... Uh, Zrayim, Moed, Nashim, Zikin. Uh, the fifth one and tomorrow. You can say it, Moshe. Kodashim. Kodashim. Zeman Nakat. Take time. That's what it means in Aramaic. To take take time. But that's a nice way to remember what are the six orders of the Mishnah. We're going to study now a Mishnah. Before we were studying a Mishnah from Seder Nizikin. Your Kavot is, uh, what number is it on the chart I gave you the other day? Right? What number is it? 39. Avot was 39. You see that on your chart? Anybody? Chagiga now is number 23. Okay, so so uh, you have it in front of you. The, uh, it's the last Masechet. Um, uh, in Seder Moed. What page is it, Moshe? Uh, it's, it's my book is 494. Good. So you all have the same book. 494. Chapter 2, Mishnah 2. Chagiga. Chapter 2, Mishnah 2. Chagiga 2 2. Chagiga 2 2. Page what page? 494. Amos 494. Okay, you surely got it. Page 494. You have the same book. No, you don't. Chapter 2, 2. Do you, not, do you, do you have a different book? I'm sorry. I have a Almost there. Oh, there it is. 494. No, 490. 490. Oh, they changed it. You have an earlier edition. They have a few pages off. I apologize. Chapter 2, Mishnah 2. Chapter 2, Mishnah 2. Does it not say 494 at the bottom? It is 494. What can I tell you? Okay. All right. Yossi ben Yoezer Omer Lismoch. Yossi ben Yochanan, Lo Lismoch, and Yossi ben Yochanan Omer Lismoch. What does that mean? So you have a translation. Yossi ben Yezer says not to lay the hands, and Yossi ben Yochanan says to lay. So what are we talking about here? Believe it or not. Laying hands on your offering, uh, on, on the offering. Good, 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 good. You, uh, most animal sacrifices brought by an individual, 
require the individual to put his hands on the head of the sacrifice. Now the problem is what happens when you bring it on Yom Tov? And there's a dispute. Because on Yom Tov you're not supposed to use animals. Leaning on the animal might be prohibited, on the other hand, bringing a sacrifice. This is a mitzvah to do on Yom Tov. So is it allowed? But you're not a Kohen. The Kohanim did all sorts of things that usually are prohibited because that was part of the ritual of the sacrifice. They would do slaughtering. You're not allowed to kill an animal on Yom Tov. They would do uh, flaying the skin. They would do all sorts of things which are not normally uh, allowed for any other Jew. The question is, this part of the process is not done by the Kohen. It's done by the owner. Is that considered to be part of the temple ritual? Is he allowed to? Does the owner of the korban bring, who brings the, the animal, does he, is he allowed to lay, or must he lay his hands on the head of the animal or not? It's a machloket. What's a machloket? A debate. A debate. Between who and who? Start from the beginning. Yossi, ben Yo'ezer, says not to lay the hands, and Yossi ben Yochanan says yes. Who are they? Anybody recognize those names? Yossi ben Yoezer and Yossi ben Yochanan. Anybody recognize those names? We just read them. In Pirkei Avot. What are they? You came in a few minutes late, but although even those guys that were here can't remember. Let's go to Mishnah Pirkei Avot. Okay, I see you're becoming a Talmudic scholar. You open up two books at once. Back to Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 4. Chapter 1, Mishnah 4. Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 4. At the same time, keep the other one open. And who are they? Received our permission from Who? Received it from Shimon right. And so who were they? Who were these two guys? They were, they were uh, the first pair. The first pair! The first of the Zugot. Now they're quoted in this Mishnah. It's fascinating. And they, they're arguing against each other. Isn't that something? The first one was the Nasi. And the other one was the head of the Beit Din. And one said, yes, we want everybody to put their hands on the animal's head. The other one says, no, no. Okay? Let's go back to the Mishnah in Chagiga. Back to the Mishnah in Chagiga. Yeah, share, share it together because we don't have another copy. Okay, sharing. Sharing. Good morning, Aaron. Yoshua ben Prachia says not to lay the hands, and Nitai Arbeli says to lay the hands. Who were they? Yoshua and Nitai. They were the next pair. You don't have to assume. We, we just learned it. Right? They're the next pair. So we have this. Yes, there. Wow. It's a machloket that doesn't get resolved. Continues into the second pair. Let's keep going. Yoda ben Tabai. One of them is the Nasi, one's the Sanhedrin, the leadership. They're arguing about this law. Yodua ben Tabai says not to lay. Shima ben Shetach says to lay the hands. Who are they? Because they, they were debating it, and each one tried to bring proofs and reasonings, and it was inconclusive. And they, 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 they didn't uh, convince the other that, that they were correct. And so they continued to have this debate. What's the proper practice? We can see that the next pair you might be more familiar with. Shmaya says to lay, Avtalian says not to lay, and finally, how many? I think we had five pairs. Is this the fifth? Yeah. Hillel. Yeah. Hillel and Menachem. wait. Menachem, who's he? You? Yeah. Why am I mentioned in the Mishnah? Am I one of the pairs? So Menachem apparently was one of the pairs. And they, he did, agreed with Hillel, he did not differ, but Menachem left, for some reason Menachem 
got uh, demoted or maybe he died, I don't know, and Shammai came in. And Shammai says not to lay and Hillel says to lay. So we have the makhluk, it continues throughout the period of the pairs, and it says the former were Nesi'im and the latter were the heads of the Beitim. So we have here the, in the Mishnah, again, at the end of Chagigah, we have that list of chain of tradition of the pairs, right? Which was at the end of the Second Temple era. And finally, uh, you know what was the end of the story? Hillel won out. And uh, we always follow Hillel's uh, halacha. Okay, the, the rest of... Um, the, the, next, the next Mishnah, the next Mishnah discuss other, other debates about, uh, about Yom Tov. But uh, this is what I wanted to show you first. Don't close your books yet because now we're going to go do something even more interesting. So far so good? So we started, started off and now we're understanding a little bit more what is the Mishnah in the period of the sages. It's a lot and lots and lots. It's a big, big book. 527 yes. chapters. Pa- jam-packed. With, with, did this Mishnah explain anything? I had to explain to you what it means, laying of the hands, delay not delay, delay delay. It doesn't give you the whole history, it doesn't give you the background. David already started asking questions, why, why? Well, you gotta study. Where are you gonna find why? Where are you gonna find? In the Talmud, of course, the Gemara discusses that. The Gemara has Gemara on Masechet Chagiga in the second chapter, has a discussion of the context and the, the deeper understanding of this debate. But the Mishnah just tells us the basic uh, bare bones uh, layout of what was discussed. Okay, And then there's a lot discussed about the laws of the festivals in okay. this... The, 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 sub, the, yeah, the subject and then the people who agree or disagree. Right, it's very, very clear. Most Mishnayot have three parts. Yeah. They, part, they have a, 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 a case, the law in that case, mm-hmm. and the, the, the people who said them. It could be there's one person and it's not disputed. It could be there's two people and there's a dispute. But basically, it's a case and a law, a case and a law, a case and a law, and what the halacha is according to this person, that person, all the different uh, opinions. But there's not much discussion. Where does that come? In the Gemara. The Gemara discussed that and they develop it. That's the Amoraim, Amoraic period. Taking the basic building blocks of the Tanaim, we don't have it on that wall yet. Um, we're going to soon, see, see, hopefully at the beginning of next week, we're going we're gonna to move ahead and, and actually record on the wall for posterity everything we've been doing this week. Uh, the reason why we're not doing it now is because it's a special day. I want to do something very special with you. Okay? That is... Uh, but before I do that, um, Moshe asked me to bring in this book of the Talmud, Bavli, in one volume. Oh! And here it is, <laughs> Talmud Bavli. You didn't think it exists. It's the Talmud Bavli in one I volume. Ex- I was expecting it to be thicker with bigger documents. Well, I'll tell you why it's thin. It's because it's four. Look at each page. Usually, this is one one page of Talmud. And this is the other side of the page, right? There's two sides. So this is two side. This is one folio, and then on, you have the, the next page. So on one, and then of course on the other side, you have you have more. So basically, you've got this is one page of Talmud. This is another page of Talmud. On the other side, you have another two pages. So basically, on one folio, instead of having one daf, you have four dafim. So that's why they could condense it all into one volume. Now, of course, this is the standard edition of the Gemara. You can look at it here closer. I'll, I'll put it over here. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Now, now um, it's obviously very small writing, but this is the standard text. In the middle only is the Gemara, and then we'll talk about what's on the outside of it another time. But uh, this is the entire Shas in one volume. How many Masechtot? How many Masechtot? So 63 Masechtot of the Mishnah. Very good. And how many have Talmud Bavli commentary and discussion of it? 
I don't think I, we have it written down. I told you it's 37. Moshe made up a mnemonic. Yes, laws. <laughs> I would rather have this be four times. It's as not day. really practical for study. It's yeah. very good for reference. You want to look something up very quickly. Uh, very quickly, yeah. that you have the whole thing there. It doesn't take up a lot of space on your shelf. You pull it out. You can find it. I would rather have this be four times as thick. I think it'd be a lot mm. more useful and a lot more like visually entertaining. A book will come apart. There's no, you can't really ha have a book that's gonna. It's on the sales still, or did they You could. It's hard to find, but you, yeah, I think they still produce them. What they have more is, and that's easy to find, is there's another edition of the entire Talmud, um, without any commentary, in one volume, and that's. Uh, it's also one long, uh, uh, approximately the size, but that's no, no, no. That's a normal. That's bigger writing. So if you don't have any commentary, it's just the text of the Talmud itself, it can be actually normal writing, and that's like that's used in libraries for reference and so forth. You can get that. But again, it's very hard to study the Talmud without its commentaries. So we need some kind of commentaries. Most, most people don't use that. This is the standard uh, text, which has a pagination, which everybody's familiar with. So if you've already studied, for example, Masechet Chagiga, and you just want to look something up, you can very quickly find it here and, and see it. But that means that in the middle is a Gemara. Correct. Correct. And, uh, and there's a commentary to that Gemara or to yes. the Mishnah? Both. Ah, both. There's the Mishnah and the Gemara in the middle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the Mishnah and the Gemara is in the middle. You have a Mishnah for a section, and then the Gemara on that Mishnah. Another Mishnah, and then the Gemara on that Mishnah. It's like a running commentary. And the commentary to both of them. And then there's commentary, both of them on the sides. That's right. On the sides we have. And the commentary comes from later periods, as we're going to get to. That's a, that's a very basic question. Sure. Why is in another type of writing this commentary? So that's interesting. Uh, the font was changed by the printers. Is it just font or is it just... It's just the font. It's the same language. But the, it's just a different font. You have to get used to it. It's, it's called like Rashi that. script. It's yeah, called yeah, yeah. Rashi didn't uh, wouldn't recognize it. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't write in Rashi. Did not write in Rashi script. Wow. But uh, it became a convention that uh, that that font was used for Rashi's commentary. To sort of it divides up the original text from the commentary. If you use a different font, you can obviously tell that this is. A commentary, and this is the original. Here, but someone has this uh, slide with the different letters, like the Rashi and the. That is, it's. I think it's 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 available online. So it's, yeah, it's I didn't bring it in, but yeah, oh, that's for another it, time. It's very. It's also very quick to learn because about fifty percent of the letters are exactly the same. Okay. Just, you know. Okay, I'd also like to show you this before we do something special for for for. Uh, uh, Lag Bomer, what do we have here? What do we have? First of all, on this side we have. Oh, that's really. Helpful. It's a nice chart, but it's all in Hebrew, so that's why I didn't give it to you. But I, that's not a problem. Good. Okay. It was for, on this side we have the entire uh, 3,500 years, sort of what we're going to be doing here, but it's all uh, in, in, on one page uh, in Hebrew. But what we have here is a nice chart of just what we're learning. The zugot, the first column is the pairs. Who do we have? Yossi and Yossi. Right? Yossi ben Yoez and Yossi ben Yochanan. Yoshua ben Prachia Nitai Arbeli. Right? The Mishnah we just learned. Yehuda ben Shetach and, and uh, Shimon. Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shetach. Shmaya and And the last of the pairs is? Hillel and Shammai, of course. Right? Hillel and Shammai. The first one was the Nasi. The second one is the Avbeitim. Right? Nasi, Avbeitim. Nasi, Avbeitim. So this is the list of the pairs. Then we have the Tanaim. The next column is what I did for you here. They said there's five generations of Tanaim. Starts off with here, first generation, Rabban, Yochanan, Ben, Zakai, and the one who asked for Yavna and its sages to be saved. Remember that story we learned about? And um, then come next generation, Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Yehoshua, who remembers the story about Rabbi Yehoshua and Rabbi Yehoshua. Lo bashamayim he. Not in heaven. 
providing the coup by a miracle or some kind of... Exactly, exactly, exactly. Then the next generation, here we're getting closer to the day, who was the student who went to tell Rabbi Eliezer that he was excommunicated? Rabbi Akiva, right? And his... We mentioned him the other day, Rabbi Yishmael. And now I want to stop for a minute. Uh, and I'll show you the rest of the chart. Oh, you know, well, let's just finish it because yeah. we're here. Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, they, uh, they were the third generation. And who do we have in the fourth generation? After Rabbi Akiva? Oh, yeah. The five students of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Lazar ben Arach, and um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, right? Mm-hmm. Today is the day of his Hilula. Okay, and then in the fifth generation, who do we have? Right, 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 Rabbi. Otherwise known as Rabbi Udanasi. Rabbi Udanasi, right? So we have five generations of the pairs, five generations of the Tanaim. So far, so good. And then what we haven't touched upon yet, and what we're going to start, is the generations of the Amoraim. Right? We started with it here, but we haven't really mentioned too many of the Amoraim. We said that there's only five generations in the land of Israel, as you can see here, the, the column here is double. Why is it double? Because in the land of Israel and in Babel. In, in Babel. So here we see that it, it, cut, it gets cut off over here. There's only five generations. This is blank. Why? Because in the land of Israel it stopped. But uh, in Babel it continued another few generations until we have at the end Ravina and Ravashi. We mentioned them before as the end of the Talmudic period. Okay, now I can get you a photocopy of this, but you know they sell them in the stores. You're really not supposed to steal, but uh, you can buy them and uh, you can take a picture if you want and just uh, for your own notes. And you, you can in most Jewish bookstores you can find these. There's even a phone number at the bottom if you want to order it. Whatever it's you know, I don't know, ten shekels. That's <laughs> not, not a lot. I, I recognize it. It's all the names. They sell it at Manny's, exactly, so it's, it's good to... I mean, but you don't need this anymore. You have it in your head. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. So what I want to do, though, I want to... I showed you... I did show and tell with the shas. Now I want to show you this. This uh, I brought in from the other room. What did we say here? The book of the... And the books of the Mishnah, we're using them, right? We're, the, the, you have them open, right? We have two parts... Open. We have something from Seder Nezikin and something from Seder Moed, right? Yes. What was from Seder Nezikin? Yes. Oh, and what was from Seder Moed that we learned? Chagiga. Very good. Laws of Yom Tov are here and the laws of ethics are in here. Very good. Now, what else did we have? I erased it already, but we said the Tanaitic period, period, the materials are written in the Mishnah. Where else are they written? Who remembers? What other collections do we have of Tanaitic statements? The same Tanaim, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Rabbi Akiva, sorry? Midrash. Midrash, very good. So I have here a few examples of Midrash. So here is, here is a Midrash, one of the most famous Midrashim, Midrash Rabbah. Here's another Midrash called Midrash Tanhuma. This one is in the volume of Esther and Song. Esther and Song and Songs. What's this one on? Uh, no. What is the organizational structure of the Midrash? It's, it's in the way of the... Uh, the, uh, midrash, uh, the commentary, the, 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 whatever, the, the content of the writing is ordered as, as the books. So right now, uh, we're going to talk... These are Midrash Yagada. Okay? These are Midrash Yagada. In a minute, I'll show you Midrash Allah. But, how, but the very fact that it's Midrash means that you have one on Esther, you have one on Shmot, you have one on the various books of the Tanakh. You open it up, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of the words of the Tanaim. This is all in English. You have left, uh, this is English and Hebrew, just a translation, very little commentary uh, in these volumes. Of course, there's other volumes with commentary. But, I mean, this is volume. Uh, uh, is this nine or eleven? Nine. 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 So, eh, wow. So there's nine volumes of this edition. Uh, only English of the Midrash Rabbah. 
It's been translated to English. These are Midrashim. These are, again, it's all the works of the Tanaim in the Midrash. Midrash. Agada is what I'm showing you now. The point is, is that it doesn't say Zraim Moed Nashim Nezakim. It says the book of Esther, the book of Shmot, correct? Here's another one. Here's another one. The Midrash. The Midrash on Tehillim. Tehillim is, of course, one of the books of the Tanakh. And you have here many, many parts of the 150 chapters of the Tehillim. There's Midrash on them as well. This is usually what most people call Midrash. When they refer to Midrash, they talk about Midrash Agada, which means it deals with ethics, history, philosophy, um, all sorts of legends, and commentary. Um, with, that's what most people associate with Midrash. But there is another type of Midrash, that's Midrash al Yesterday, I talk, told you that there's the school of Rabbi Ishmael and the school of Rabbi Akiva. And what we have here is, you can see here the volumes. It's a three-volume set. Very hard to find it in most Bathe Midrash, but we're lucky to have it here. It's a translation, English and Hebrew, of the Mechilta. Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael. Mechilta de Rabbi Ishmael. Here's another uh, a, a copy of the same thing. As you can see here, it's called the Mechilta. It's the Mechilta of Rabbi Ishmael. You can uh, hand, these, uh, uh, hand these around so you can take a look. Have copies and uh, see what it looks like. Basically, you have a verse and you have a comment, a verse and a comment. And um, this is the structure of, of the Midrashe Halacha and Midrashe Agada, as I showed you here, the words of the Tanaim. The only thing I haven't shown you yet about the Tanaim is the Tosefta. Tosefta, you can open, open up any volume of Talmud in the standard printings of the Talmud. And at the very back, on the last pages, it says on the top, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but it says Tosefta. The Tosefta is the last few pages. They add in, uh, it's, a, it's a great edition of the printers. They, they used a very poor manuscript in most of the editions, but there is other, there is other it is Tosefta on Brachot, Tosefta on Pe'an, Tosefta on all of the various Masechtot. We said that there's a, what is the Tosefta? It's a collection of Brachot. What are Brachot? Tanaitic statements which did not make it into the Mishnah. Into the Mishnah. They could be in the Midrash as well, but they're not in the Mishnah. They're not in the Mishnah. That's why they're called Bar. Outside. Braita. Something outside. Outside teaching. Anyway, so now we've really... Uh, let's, let's do something special for, for uh, Lagba Omer. Open up again. Masechet Chagiga. To chapter 2. Now let's go to Mishnah 1. Huh. Chapter 2, Mishnah 1. We'll do it in English because our Hebrew levels are very different. It's a very cryptic Mishnah. But I want to tell you, before that, I want to share with you uh, um, the following statement. What does it mean when we say that the uh, David quoted it the other day that there's that there's four types of, of studying Torah pardes pshat remez drash and so I'll put that on the board. Can I erase this already? I think I have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Time. Right. So we speak about. Um, so we'll do it in Hebrew. Par des. Par des means an orchard, okay? But it's used as an acronym in this case. Shot. Remez. Drash. Sur. 
So Psat usually means the, uh, the simple meaning of any text or any tradition. Rem is, is a type of, type of uh, approach to the text which says the text is so pregnant with meaning that maybe there's hints inside the text that's hinting to other things as well as what the simple meaning, the simple reading is. Dirash, of course, uh, means to derive. Like a moral? Not only moral, also legal. Also legal derivations. To, to derive, uh, infer from yeah. one principle, another principle. So, what, what do you think the word midrash comes from? Yeah. Right? Midrash. It's a teasing out of the text, inferring from it an, ex- uh, an extension. There's different ways of, of uh, you know, in logic they speak of inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. That's why I say to deduce, to, to uh, infer. I like to use the word derive. We're deriving from the text. Um, additional meanings, additional laws, additional uh, uh, implications. So that's drash. And the fourth type of, of uh, uh, study that we do, it's called sod. Sod is, is uh, usually translated as secret. So the, um, uh, unlike Bomer, usually we celebrate the Torah of sod. Now, the secret Torah. What does that mean? That the, the secrets of Torah. As a matter of fact, go to the bookshelf, open up the Zohar, and you can read it. Can we have it here? Yes, of course. Yeah. There's no secrets. What's secret about it? Okay, maybe at one point it was secret, but we live in an age with no secrets. So what's secret? When we say it's the... Uh, we talked about, there's another, there's another word that we use. There's the revealed Torah. Nigle means reveal. Versus the nistar. This is revealed. Versus the hidden. The hidden Torah. Versus the revealed Torah. What is that? What's hidden about it? I mean, revealed, maybe you could say this is somehow sort of parallel to the pshat versus the so The pshat is the simple reading that's revealed, the simple uh, reading and the meaning that you could just, you know, uh, from a, a superficial analysis of the words. And the, the secrets is the, the hidden meaning behind it, what is, what, it, what it's uh, sort of maybe also connected to hinting, what it hints to, which is not explicitly stated. But what is, uh, it's a strange thing that they call it, the secrets of Torah. Well, because it's, it's hidden in a way it's written. Like, true, true. So, but the, the problem is, though, over the course of uh, centuries, the meanings that were uh, not explicit at first, they were not the simple meaning. Other texts were written where it's explicit. And the, the, those books, the books of Kabbalah, there, the, the, it's not hidden. That's the simple meaning. They speak directly about the metaphysics and not about the simple meaning of the, the words of the Torah. So why do we still call it a secret? So I heard a beautiful explanation. This is that what, what makes it secret is not that it, you don't know about it, because that's, that's, that's nonsensical. They say that, for example, when you speak about... Um, when you love someone, so it's very hard to express that love in words. Let me ask you a question. Can you explain to somebody who's blind the difference between uh, red and blue? Somebody who doesn't have any taste buds. I know a lot of people had corona recently. No sense of taste. Can you explain to them what the difference between the taste of, of, of steak is and the taste of chocolate? Can you explain in words these other types of senses? Can you translate one to the other? It's very difficult. Explain what is the sensation of red. Somebody's colorblind. He doesn't see red or blue. What do you explain to him what it is? Only if I reference, I'm, uh, if 
It's impossible. It's impossible. Ram, Ram, I have a better one for you. Yeah. Explain to me the difference between right and left. That's interesting because it's always relative. What's yeah, it's kid. Kid. Yeah. Kid. yeah. <laughs> yeah fair. So perhaps when we say we're talking about the secret Torah, the point is not that nobody knows about it. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a secret that you know only a small group uh, or or something that the, the meaning is hidden. Perhaps that's closer because what does it mean that the meaning is hidden? That it's we're discussing matters which are very hard mm-hmm. to explain. It's very hard to put your finger on it mm-hmm. and to, to, to uh, define it well. Maybe it's impossible. Speak about God. Can you really define God? Right? We say, He's infinite. We're finite. What, what's infinite? You can't just, do we understand that it means that He knows the, the, the future just like the past? How can you know the future? Just like the past, there's so many paradoxes when it comes to uh, speaking about God and trying to understand God. That essentially, it's a secret. It's something that we can't describe. And so of course, what is the Kabbalah? What is the mystical science of Judaism? Doing exactly that, <laughs> trying to describe the indescribable, and uh, understand why it remains. It remains hidden even though there's books filled that you can get on the library and read them. There's many, many books, many, many descriptions. It still remains hidden because it's very hard to describe. Like you can't describe taste to somebody who has no taste. And like you can't describe love. People have been trying for uh, all of civilization's history to, wow. to, to talk about love and to write about love and poems of love and sing about love, no but to, to, to actually explain no what it is is very difficult. No right? No. It's very difficult. You could, the, the, of course, the no. biologists and the you know the, the reductionists speak about oh, there's certain neurons firing in your brain, or, but that's you know we we move beyond that the simple understanding of the human condition. We're not just you know, uh, neurons and, and uh, uh, physics and biology. Something else? Something else. Yes, Thomas. That means that it, it, it's like, it, that's like a sense is uh, what you dis- describe, like the taste or, or emotions, like the feelings. Yes. Is a part of uh, uh, us that is uh, part of us, but it's not the. Uh, uh, Physical, let's say, I don't know. That's right. Some is, people say is, that there's something called the sixth sense. sense. Have you ever heard of the people talking about the sixth sense? Well, there's, well, well, there's way more than five senses. There's, okay. You have a sense of a... a no, but there's a concept in, in culture yeah. that there's the, the sixth sense is yeah. another type of spiritual type of intuition yeah. or something like that, yeah. which, which uh, we can't really measure. But, um, you know, we, we, we think it exists. Yes. <laughs> My question is that that means that in, in, the, in the life with God uh, and the Torah, there is a level that we need to develop or discover or start to be aware of it in our life? Or is that I believe so. It? Yes, I believe that's a good this point. Is about this book that help us? It, it's not a book. It's a, it's a field of study. Oh, it's a field of study, and I think that, uh, of course, the, the primary book that everybody celebrates today is the Zohar, which is known as the, the primary book of the Kabbalah, but it, it's an attitude. It's a, it's like you, I, I like what you said. You go to the gym to work on your biceps and your triceps and the different muscles of your body. You go to religious school, the Beit Midrash, to develop... Your spiritual muscles, not only your brain muscles. Of course, there's a lot of study, intellectual study in the baby Josh too. Really, to to if you want to grow as a Jew, it involves tefillah. I, I many times use this metaphor and I say tefillah is like a muscle. If you don't practice it, it atrophies. If you don't use it, you won't you won't be able. You have to you have to get good at it by by doing it, and over and over and over. We dive three times a day, even though each time is not necessarily the highest spiritual experience. But you you try, and over time, it's like going to the gym every day. You don't lift 100, uh, 350 pounds every day. But uh, you start slowly, and you progress, and you develop, and hopefully you also develop spiritually, that spiritual muscle, whatever, you know, I don't know where it is. <laughs> 
heart, the mind, in between, wherever, uh, in your backbone, I don't know, in your kishkas, in your intestines, uh, so many different uh, options for where it could be, but it's not something physical, it's not a real uh, place, it's, it's, it's part of our makeup, you know, we, we speak about the soul, right? Again, these are things that in your heart, it's hard to define. You can't, you can't describe them. They're so, it's the, it's the hidden part of, of, of our tradition. And it's very hard to define. Yes? Is it true that then you could go to these terms? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, so, so, par days, it's usually pronounced this way. Par days. If we had time, uh, um, I'd show you something else, but another time. Pshat. Remez, Derash, and Sod. These part days. Nig, Le, and Nis, Ha. Part days, it means an orchard, but it's an acronym. You see here the Pe, Reish, Dalid, and Samech. So it's used as an acronym for these four ways of approaching Torah. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple way, the, the simple meaning, the, the hints that are in the text, deriving things from the text. That's midrash, drash, right? And so the the uh, perhaps the, the secret meaning which the the simple reading is supposed to is, is covering over. It's sort of like it's, it's sort of like uh, sometimes we uh, the, the Zohar describes the following. We said the Zohar is structured like midrash. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, the Zohar brings the following example. It says, when you read the words of the Torah, there's a simple reading. Uh, okay, uh, Yaakov went and he kissed Rachel when he saw her. Okay, simple meaning. There was a fellow called Jacob, and he was excited to see this beautiful girl, and uh, her name was Rachel. And he was so moved that he got close to her and he put his lips on her uh, to, to her cheek or whatever it is, and he kissed her. Okay, that's the pshat, simple level. What does the Zohar teach us? The Zohar teaches that many times you're looking at the Torah wrong, or not wrong, but that's that's only one way of looking at the Torah. There's there's another way. The Torah is like he says, it's like clothing. The words of the Torah, the story that I just told you. That's just clothing that's covering over the, the body, the person that's underneath it. Words, how many arms do I have? And how many legs do I have? How do you know that? Can you see my arms? Can you see yes. my legs? No, you can't. You can see my sleeves and you can see my pants. You don't yes, see my arms underneath You can assume, right? You're assuming that now my, my hand. But how do you know what's over here? You can't see that. The robot arm. It could be. That's right. It could be a robotic arm. You don't know. But and, and then and then um, That's how it's just the torso that's your robot. How do I know you have a brain? I can't see your brain. Right. We assume there's something in there by how you act. Sometimes the opposite, right? But <laughs> by some things you say, we we'll say, hmm, is there a brain in there, right? <laughs> I <am. laughs> But um, the idea is as follows. That the simple story that the Torah tells us, it's the outer clothing of the inner spiritual idea that really, well, you know what the Torah was talking about? Jacob represents, he, we're not talking about a person called Jacob. Jacob represents a certain attribute, a certain way of acting in the world. And Rachel also, she represents, uh, let's say, uh, mercy. Okay, Jacob re represents uh, beauty. And when it means that Jacob kissed Rachel, it means, what is kiss? What is kissing? We all know what kissing is. But what is, what is the essence, the essential meaning of kissing? It means coming close. Coming close. It means a connection. A bond. That's right. So what does it mean? It means when the Torah was speaking about Yaakov kissing Rachel, that's on the simple level. It means there was a fellow called Yaakov who kissed uh, Rachel. And we all know. But perhaps what the Torah is describing is that there is uh, 
two ways of living in the world, the way of mercy and the way of beauty, and they can come together and they, they create a bond. And if we speak about it in terms of representing spiritual ideas, perhaps heavenly ideas, God is acting in the world like Jacob, and then God is acting in the world like Rachel. And sometimes he acts in the world when those two connect and combine. You can have uh, a loving relationship. Love is in the world. Well, that's another one of those things that it's hard to define, right? So we understand that the, this is the essence of what uh, the mystical part of Judaism is doing. Torah tasod. It's, called, it's even called the Torah tasod. I said yesterday that people consider Shavuot to be the day we accept Except the revealed Torah. Yeah. And like Torah, Omer, the day we celebrate the receiving the hidden Torah, right? And that's why uh, a lot of people are very excited about it, because they like the hidden Torah. But I want to show you the Mishnah, the Chagiga. The Mishnah, right, the Shisha Sidra Mishnah, most of it is very clearly revealed Torah. It's laws. For some ethics, we saw Pir Kavod, right? we have it on our tables, Pir Kavod. Some of it, there are some hints to other parts of Torah. This Mishnah. Chagiga, chapter 2, Mishnah 1. Everybody have it? Open it up. Chagiga, chapter 2, Mishnah 1. It says as follows. You want to read it for us, Moshe? Hebrew English. English. The laws of incest may not be expounded to three persons. What does that mean? Um, well, you know what incest means. And what is the laws of incest? Well... Expounded. What 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 does what expound mean? <laughs> studied or explained. Explain, right, it's teached, uh, taught. Um, so so the sexual laws, what's was permitted, what's forbidden, they're quite intricate. Forbidden relationships, uh, but then, and then go. Uh, the reason why it's mentioned here is because there's there's other forbidden relationships which are uh, matters of law. And it says, well, you're not allowed to expound upon them with three. What does that mean, three? Three what? Three, well, three persons. Why not? Two, two kind of persons. Because they're not uh, ready for it. Or they can do this. Possibly. Possibly. To avoid, like, like, two, 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 in other words, we have a nice, small, intimate class. What are we, 10 people here? Less, what? So, so uh, if you had 100 people, so now you can all, all ask questions and we can have interactions and have discussions. But if with 100 people, it, 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 it would just be a lecture, right? And so I think that's what it's trying to say. This, the classroom, when you're discussing these severe laws of forbidden sexual relations, it has to be very tiny because we've got to make sure you get everything just right. How do we do that? By s making the class size smaller. So only, only three. Even less than three. It sounds like three is not allowed. So only two. So you have one teacher with two students. That's allowed. Okay, because the laws are so complex, perhaps sensitive, that you know. Ah, now we move on from the law, legal realms, legal realms, and what, do, what does it say? You're not a, go ahead, Moshe. Uh, nor the story of creation before two persons. Ah, so what does that mean? So two teacher. One. Right, only one um, teacher. One teacher with one student. student. What is the? Uh, uh, do one more. Go ahead. Nor the subject of the chariot for one person alone, unless he be a sage and comprehends of his own knowledge. Without well, that, that's a small class. <laughs> <laughs> we have small one classes one. in Mahon Meir, but if you're not even allowed to have one person in your class, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're <laughs> that's by yourself. Pretty, exactly, you're studying by yourself. And that's not allowed unless you're wise already and so you understand it by yourself. Now, what I don't understand, I explained to you the structure of the mission, okay? Three, two, one. It's got to be small classes, very sensitive material. But what are we talking about? So it's a, incest, sexual forbidden uh, relations that I understand what they are. What is the act of creation and what is the chariot? <laughs> Interesting. In Hebrew, ma'aseh bereshit and ma'aseh merkava. So merkava, it's reservation, proxy? Maybe. Merkava is a vehicle. It's a vehicle, it means a chariot. Yes. It refers to the something which is uh, moving us. 
Pass me a Tanakh, please. Everybody grab a Tanakh for a second. Pass me a Tanakh, please. Open up to the book of Yechezkel, chapter 1. The book of Yechezkel, chapter 1, is on page, in this edition, it's on page 949. Ezekiel chapter 1? Ezekiel chapter 1. Who's going to read for us? I volunteer to read. You volunteer to read. So you read. Chapter one, chapter one, right at the beginning. Yes. Now, okay. Okay. So, go ahead. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, that in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, Chebar, oh, uh, Kibar, Kibar that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Yehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Tavar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud of fire, and folded itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings, and their feet were straight feet. And the sole of the feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of man under their wings, and on the force, on their four sides. And they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined to one another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man. And the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another. The two covered their bodies. Thanks, Paige. Go ahead. And they went every one straight forward, with the spirit what is was to go. They went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran, and returned, as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld ooh, the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a, of a pharaoh. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon, excuse me, and they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their wings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Oh my gosh. Whither so ever the spirit was to go, they went. Tither was their spirit to go. And the. Excuse me. A to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Okay, let's stop here, because uh, if it's too much, we won't understand. Uh, <laughs> This is a great example of what I said, that it's, it's open book, it's part of the Tanakh, but 
it remains hidden. Yeah, it's a secret. What is going on? This is a vision of Yechezkel. It's known as the vision of the chariot. Did you catch that last part about the wheels? There's four wheels. They're going in each direction. Have you seen the new cars? That, yeah, the concept cars that can like go uh, go sideways as well as yeah. forward. It's like they have the instead of the, the the tires that we have, they're like sort of balls. And somehow they managed to, to trans. It sounds like that's what they're describing. But anyways, no, what is going on here? It's a chariot. It's it's this is the vision of Yechezkel. It's known as the act of the chariot, the vision of the chariot. Or, and the study of it is called Ma'ase Merkava. One does not study about the chariot unless you are with uh, by yourself you really can't even teach that it's so sensitive it's so interesting what are we talking about ah, <laughs> because you're all wise and understand on your own and i have na- now i've given you now i've given you enough understanding to recognize what's going on here what we're talking about, what this Mishnah is talking about is what's the, studying Kabbalah. What's Maaseh We'll get there. And now I just explained Maaseh Merkava. One at a time. <laughs> One at a time. Even that, I'm still trying to finish up. Maaseh Merkava, the standard interpretation, it, it means all the mystical secrets of Judaism. Like this first chapter of Yechezka, which is a prophetic vision of what's going on with the angels in the angelic world. Wings, faces, creatures that have the face of man and the face of an lion, and it has four faces, voice of an eagle. What is this? Wait, so, I, so this is a vision of music, uh, yes, prophecy. Yes, a prophecy, correct. Very thin diseases. It's not, I suppose it's not taken literally also. Uh, I imagine and not, four yeah. Faces, um, it's interesting, they uh, match with the uh, these four uh, signs of the astro- astro- astrological circle. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, they many interpretations. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. For sure. What, what are wings versus hands? And what is this? There's all this uh, lightning. It's very dynamic. Right? The vision is yeah, like... Oh, a, it all circles back to the chariot. With the wheels. The chariot seems to be uh, holding them, or they are the chariots. It's, yeah. it's really unclear that somehow they they. But it said before they had the feet of of uh, what do they have the feet of like uh, feet of a calf. of a calf. They have hooves, some sort. But then now there's wing. Now there's wheels, some kind of wheels. Ofanim. Does anybody remember where we say ofanim in in our prayers? Yeah. yeah. And chayot, is the Hebrew is chayot. Vofanim the chayot hakodesh. We say them in our prayers. We speak about these angels in our prayers. They, how they praise God, and uh, it comes from uh, the book of Yechezkel. There's other uh, descriptions. I, now I want you to turn, please, to uh, Yeshayahu chapter 6. Yeshayahu chapter 6. This is another uh, vision that he had of his uh, six, 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 six. Yeah. Yeah. Six verse. Uh, one. Okay, beginning of chapter six of page seven, five, nine in these books. Go for it, David. Uh, page seven, five, nine. Okay. The year of King I have different translations of it. That's fine. It's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll follow along. Yeah. In the year of King Uziel's death, I saw the Lord sitting upon a high and lofty throne, and its legs filled the temple. Seraphim were standing about at his service. Each one had six wings. With two, it would cover its face. With two, it would cover its legs. And with two, it would fly. And one would call to another and say, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. <laughs> Yeah, fair. And, uh, the mass of visions, the, world, the whole world is filled with his, with his glory. The doorpost moved many cubits, and the sound of the calling and the temple became filled with smoke. Okay, stop there. So we see that there's 
uh, a similar vision, not the same, obviously, but there's another vision of angels, seraphim. So we have seraphim, chayot, ofanim, all these different types of angels. It's hidden to us. It's hidden to us. It's hidden to us. Do we really know what these angels mean? So we have to try to, to study the Torah also in the fourth way. Just like we try to study Midrash and we try to study, uh, you know, the hints in the Torah. We try to study the simple meaning of the Torah. We try to derive things. So it's all part of Torah. And here it is in the Mishnah, a little bit of a... Most of the Mishnah doesn't really talk about mystical secrets. We have it in the Prophets a little bit. But in the Mishnah, there's very little. This Mishnah says you're not allowed to teach it. Uh, with uh, too many people because it's such a sensitive topic. But it sounds like you're supposed to study it. Just, you have to be careful. Yeah. Um, okay, so if it's hidden, yes. why was it given in the first place? Mm. Why was it given in the first place? Moshe, Moshe, what would life be like without love? Do you think if we only had in our lives things that we could define and measure what would life well, really be I, like? I can understand love even if I can't define it. I can personally understand it. You can experience it, and I think you can and I think you can experience spirituality too. Okay. You may not maybe not on the level of Yeshayahu or Yechizkel, okay. but you can uh, have some level of of, uh, of relationship with God, which is beyond uh, the mind and your mouth and your physical senses, there's a spiritual sense that you can develop and you should be developing mm -hmm. to connect to God. Yes, I believe so. Maybe, I think mm -hmm. that doesn't answer my question. So no. why did God create them? Because this is a very uh, a, amazing gift. It's part of the life that he gave us, which is a very rich part of life, very meaningful part of life, even though you can't uh, yeah. define it till the very end. You can't put your finger on it and you can't touch it. It's still very valuable. It invokes another desire to go and understand, try to get deep Oh, sure. Always trying to get close to God. We try and come close to God. He's infinite. We'll never reach him, right? But still, there is a there is some connection there. Yes, Ariel, you want to say something? Most of you guys know why it's hidden. But why was it hidden? If it's so hidden, why was it? Why were we even given a bit of it in the first place? Right, so I hope I answered that. because Even if we can't ultimately understand, you can't grasp it with our rational faculties, there's other faculties with which we are supposed to grasp it and try to understand it. Why? Um, it might be people who questions like I did. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it might, if you're in like a bigger group, but there might be people who are not on that level, like to comprehend it, like clearly, and they might think something else. And I think I get, there's uh, a danger. There's a danger, yeah. Of misunderstanding, danger so of you yeah. Kind of have like a tight circle, that, like this is what I was hinting to before. Know. There's a story about four scholars. Tanaim, Rabbi Akiva is one of them. That's why I was going to study with you, but we don't have time for it. Who entered the orchard? Oh, what does that mean? They entered the orchard. So it's usually used, understood to be a, a, a metaphor for a, a mystical uh, experience. As they 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 meditated uh, upon upon these secrets of Torah. And they had these spiritual experiences. And of the four, only Rav Yekiva entered the orchard safely and exited the orchard safely. Ben Zoma went in, but he went crazy. Ben Azai went in and he died. The fourth one was Acher, who became a heretic. Fascinating, fascinating. Midrash, again, we don't have time to go into depth, but there's this concept of, of delving into the, the, uh, the mystical sides of, uh, uh, of Judaism. That there's a danger there. Ariel is, is suggesting that that's why the Mishnah in front of us in Chagiga limits the, uh, the instruction. Uh, to, and and the, let's just continue and finish the end of the Mishnah because at least we'll learn one Mishnah today. Well, we learned already a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. We learned Mishnah in Chagigat. Mishnah 2, we learned, right? The, the pairs. 
And the, the machloket about the smicha, it's called smicha in Hebrew, the laying of the hands is called smicha, not the smicha of your blanket, and not the smicha of ordination of rabbis, but the smicha of the laying on of the hands. The smicha has many different meanings. It's a complicated language, Hebrew. What can I tell you? Let's finish this Mishnah. This Mishnah is, seems to be a continuation about the same theme, These, this, this, the, the issues of the chariot, Maaseh Bereshit, before we continue, I'll answer David's question. What is Maaseh Bereshit? Not quite sure. There are different interpretations. The Rambam seems to say Maaseh Bereshit means biology, believe it or not, and physics. Science. Science. Analyzing the physical world as opposed to Maaseh Merkava, which is the metaphysical world. And the Rambam says... This is uh, an amazing pursuit which should inspire you to worship God, to love God. The more you see about God's creation, the physical parts of God, the, the wonders of chemistry and physics and biology, the more you understand that, the more you'll be inspired to love God. And the Rambam says that's what it means, Ma'aseh Bereshit, the works of creation. Others say that, you know, why should it be limited then? <laughs> why should it be limited to two people? What's dangerous about studying physics and biology? It doesn't really fit with our Mishnah. Our Mishnah seems to be speaking about, you know, works of the chariot, Ma'asem Merkava, that's clearly metaphysics, that's, that's uh, stuff which is it's hard to, to define, the hidden parts of, of, of our Torah, so Maaseh Bereshit, they say, also refers to another part, type of, of the uh, mystical parts of Judaism, okay? So Maaseh Bereshit, um, you, you might have heard of, now you might, uh, you might have heard of this. We talked about how the, the Tanaim were so spiritual, so powerful, they could do miracles, right? We saw that. Rabbi Shem Rayuchai killed people with his gaze, right? Rabbi Eliezer may move to the tree, right? And made the, the river run upstream, etc., etc. So there is a, 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 a principle, you might have heard of it, that these Kabbalists, they used, they had a, a, a special magic. You know what the magic was? What was their tool of magic that they used? Meditation. Meditation on what? What are the basic building blocks of creation, right? The Ma'aseh Bereshit, creation, it doesn't mean the, the, the biology and physics and chemistry. What, what is the building blocks of creation? That's creation itself. Or the, the, our sages tell us it's the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Oh, oh, yes. The Kabbalists know how to take the different letters and combine them in unique ways. Maybe even the names of God and the letters of the names of God and combine them in different ways. And that's called Ma'aseh Bereshit and Ma'aseh Merkava is the combinations of them. Uh, it could be study of the, the, the mystical secrets of the alphabet. Oh, like how um, inside the white space of a pay, there is a, be, uh, a base. Right, right. That's right. What is inside? So, in the white space of a, well, when, when a pay is written as, as it is say, in, in, the, in the Torah, in the white space, in the negative space, there's a base. Yefet. Yefet. So that concept is perhaps... Even Ma'aseh Bereshit can refer to other types of, of uh, secrets. Okay? Let's finish the Mishnah. Next. Whoever looks at four things, it were better for him that he had not come to the world. That's pretty uh, bad curse. That's like, don't do that. Right? It would be better not to, not, to be, not to have been born. Right? To... If you do these one of these four things, then you don't deserve to live. You, you're doing such an evil thing, such a terrible thing, 
that it would be better that you wouldn't have been born at all. Because it's these things, these four things are just so bad. What are the four things? David, read them for us. Um, what is above? What is below? What is beyond? What is in the opposite beyond? What does that mean? That's cryptic. I've many times asked, what's above my head? The ceiling. What's below me? The ground. What is before is, well, what happened yesterday. And what is after, or uh, what's in front of me, or what's behind me. What's so bad about asking these four questions? <sighs> this is cryptic. This is very hard to understand. What do you think it means? Can you say this name, uh, uh, what is beyond this uh, future thing? Maybe. What's opposite is past. Okay, but what's wrong with looking what's in the past? So, Lamala, I understand a little bit. As we said before. God is usually above, and if you try to understand God, then you're barking up the wrong tree, or you're doing something wrong, because you're trying to really... Be God, right? If, if I knew him, I would be him, right? There's yeah. such a, a, a phrase. Very hard to understand. So I understand, don't, don't dwell too much on trying to understand what's above. Okay. But what's wrong with what's below? What would be below? Maybe a metaphor maybe, for it. could maybe say uh, Namata, meaning like um, space. Could be. Like, could be. Could be. There's other. Uh, the, I know, but it's just, why is it so bad though to, to study science, to to study astronomy, and to study molecules? I don't see anything wrong with it. Perhaps it's, it's reference to Olam Haba and um, that which was before Olam Haba, or, or I guess I guess it's like where, where you were before you were born and where you'll be after you die. Very cryptic. It's very difficult. I don't understand. Um, well, what is above and what is below? So what is below? So you can't do uh, geology? can't dig into the ground and into the sea to understand what's wrong? What's above and below? So if we said above might be God, below might be hell, right? heaven and hell, maybe. maybe. So don't try to understand what hell is. We don't have hell. There, I wouldn't. I don't want to get into it because uh, it's, it's not a good idea. Just, I don't know. That's a good question. Well, no, there's there's verses in the Torah that speak about a place called Sheol. Sheol is uh, usually associated with the below. Okay, okay. I, I understand. I understand. I understand. These 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 are concepts which are mysteries, right? They're hidden. They're very hard to define. Um, and what is below? Uh, uh, let me read to you what Kahati, Rabbi Kahati, right? If you want to. Where is Rabbi Kahati? Where is his name? Did I erase it? I erased it. Not so bad. Anyways, Rabbi Kahati says as follows. Yeah, I have it here on my phone. Whoever looks at four things, it would be better if he had not come to the world. These are the four things. What is above? Beyond the heavens. What is below the earth? What is before what was before the world was created? And what is after what will transpire at the end of the days? Our Mishnah teaches that since these things cannot be grasped by man with his limited comprehension, their investigation might result in error and confusion in matters of faith. So it's hard to know exactly what the Mishnah refers to, but seems to be talking about the Torah of the Sod. And so the hidden Torah, the, 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 uh, the Nistar Torah. So you have to, uh, if you want to study it, the Mishnah seems to say, don't. It's better that you had wouldn't be born. On the other hand, the beginning of the Mishnah says, you can study it as long as there are limited classrooms. So it's very hard to understand. There seems to be a, a wary... Um, tension here between, of course, we have to study it, and it's so important and so sensitive that you have to have small classes and you have to be wise and understand it on its own. Uh, the bottom line is that we do have a mystical tradition. We do have a lot of metaphysics. We started off, of course, the words of the prophets and to understand them. And the sages throughout the generations uh, taught many things about the, the spiritual world, which 
are hard to uh, comprehend in simple, uh, you know, Cartesian logic and those kind of things. But um, this is uh, a little bit about the so the pardes entering the pardes and. Uh, uh, the end of the Mishnah, let's just finish up the Mishnah. The end of the Mishnah says, Kol shalochasal quote kono, whoever does not have regard for the honor of his creator, it would be better for him not to come into the world. Another curse upon somebody who, maybe it's a question of approach. Yeah. If you approach it with the proper respect for the master of the world who created all these things, then uh, it's okay. But... Uh, you have to make sure that you have the proper respect. That's where the idea is that, you know, if you're going to study Kabbalah, you have to go to the mikvah, you have to prepare, maybe you have to have a lot of knowledge in the revealed parts of Torah. It's like uh, if, you, if you eat a lot of sugar before dinner, then you won't be hungry for dinner. So the Torah says, the, 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 the Talmud says, anybody who hasn't filled his belly with, with meat and potatoes should not get involved in the hidden parts of the Torah. What is the meat and potatoes? The Talmud, the Mishnah. <laughs> Just don't have dessert first. But, um, okay, so this will, this will be our, uh, enough what we can say a little bit about Jewish mysticism for today and uh, for the week, really, because this is Thursday and we don't have class tomorrow. Of course, of course. So, um, I wish you a holy and spiritual Shabbat, and maybe you'll have visions of uh, the angels and uh, the chariots, but uh, keep it to yourself. If you know. <laughs> uh, and Bezat uh, Hashem will continue and finish up with the period of the sages, Bezat Hashem, next week. We have to talk a little bit more about the, the Gemara, the Gemara. This is really introduction to Gemara. Now we talk about the Amoraim. We talk a lot about the Tanaim. But uh, the Amoraim, we have barely mentioned who they are. And uh, we're not going to go in at length. We're going to move on. We have the Goanim, the Rishonim, and the Chronim. We have uh, 3,500 years of Jewish history to, to, to put into our framework. Uh, but uh, we're going to finish up with the sages probably next week. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is what we call Kabbalah. Yes? Right.